Brandon D'Alamonte with the City of Pittsburgh's Office of Special Events. And for this year's Black History Month, we are featuring Pittsburgh jazz legends. So today I have the honor of welcoming on Pittsburgh jazz legend, George Benson, who doesn't have a lot of time for us today. So I just want to jump straight into it and ask him, George, what was it like growing up in Pittsburgh and everything about the music that was going on in the uh, 1950s and 60s? <laughs> it was an interesting time. I had a singing group. And at that time, singing groups were very popular. And my group was one of the most popular groups in the Pittsburgh tri-state area where we had West Virginia, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. So those little towns, and we had dozens of them. We had plenty of work. We didn't make a lot of money, but we had plenty of work. Yeah. <laughs> and so the singing group was the thing that was keeping me going. I was known as Little Georgie Benson, the singer. Not a guitar player yet, but I did dibble and dabble with the with the guitar at the time. That's great. I know one of the stories I read was that uh, you got your start playing at a corner drugstore and then eventually a nightclub that uh, I guess went on to be shut down. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, my first day at selling a newspaper was when I was seven. You had to be at least seven before you could sell newspapers. So the first, my first day at newspaper, I had to take my ukulele with me because I forgot to take it upstairs and leave it in my, in my house. So I took it to the newspaper stand and the guy agreed to hold it until I got back from selling papers. I sold exactly one newspaper that day. <laughs> I got my one penny for selling it, plus a 20 cent tip. So for a seven year old, that was pretty good. I had 21 cents to spend at the candy counter. Yeah. So I went in the drugstore, which is right next door. And I was looking in the candy counter and somebody came up to me and said, hey, little boy, can you play that thing? So I turned around and struck out into a song called uh, 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 Bloodshot Eyes. And I started strumming it and the crowd formed around and they were going in their pockets, but I couldn't stop singing and strumming. So I just, they just went in their pockets and my cousin came in the door Saw him going in the pocket, took his cap off, and passed it around, and we had my first payday. <laughs> yeah, nice. So how did you get your start into music? I know you just mentioned the ukulele. Was that really your first introduction to it, or was there was there maybe another instrument or that got your attention, or what? I tried to play the violin when I was very little. Now, my hands were still small, but the violin would have been a good instrument. I imagine by now I would have turned into something, you know, uh, halfway decent, <laughs> you know, all those years. But at that time, the teacher found out that I was not reading the music and he wasn't happy about that. So they kicked me out of the violin class at a very young age. I guess I was about five years old. I started school early. I started kindergarten when I was four years old. Everybody else in class was five or six years old. So I was always the littlest guy in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the name Little Georgie Benson. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, seems like it worked out for you, so. Yeah. So, uh, did you have any inspirations growing up? Uh, was there someone locally or even on a national level who kind of inspired you to pursue music professionally? This is amazing. I lived near a kind of a mecca there where they had a lot of bars and a lot of traffic, streetcars and buses, and a lot of cars on, on cobblestone streets, the main intersection that they branched out into different parts of the city. But that main part, everyone wanted to get to that place. It was uh, Wiley Avenue. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had the Stanley Bar on one corner, and then they had the Blue Note on another corner. And uh, down the other corner, they had another bar, and then they had uh, uh, the jazz club, which burnt down while I was down there. <laughs> they moved uptown. But anyway, everybody came through there, and I found out later why. People coming from the Midwest, like Charlie Parker and all those great musicians, mm -hmm. they were trying to get to the Big Apple, New York. And they had just built something phenomenal in the United States the Pennsylvania Turnpike, which was 300 miles long. So it was a 300 mile straight shot to New York City, the Big Apple, from Pittsburgh. Yeah. So they went and did all their jamming in Pittsburgh. 
And that's why Billy Eckstein had the greatest jazz band in history. His pianist was Sarah Vaughn. He had um, Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, and uh, Art Blakey was his drummer. Ray Brown was his bass player, just to name a few. Yeah. The whole band was loaded with people who became superstars in the jazz world later. And starting with Billy Eckstein himself, who was a, he was an instrumentalist too. He played the Val Trombone and um, a great singer. So they congregated in Pittsburgh. So a lot of those people saw me as little Georgie Benson, the seven year old walking around the corner with a ukulele in his hand. Mm -hmm. And they gave me quarters, including the great Charlie Parker who was my natural father's best friend. He hung out with Charlie Parker a lot. Wow. And he tried to get me to copy him when I when I was coming up. I didn't know who the heck he was talking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. So how would you describe the music that you typically create? I know I've seen, you know, everybody try to define it from R&B to pop and jazz. Is there a label you give yourself or is it kind of just free form to you? It won't make any difference what you call yourself because people are going to find another name for you. Mm -hmm. Good or bad. <laughs> You're allowed to call you something you don't want to be called. But, but uh, that's what life is all about. They're going to see you from their point of view. And um, although the music was called bebop, they ended up calling it jazz. The music that was created by Charlie Parker and um, and Dizzy Gillespie and Thelonious Monk and Charlie Christian was called bebop. But it sounded so much like jazz, the critics just called it jazz music. Mm -hmm. When actually it was a whole different culture. It was a highly sophisticated, and I say that by harmony. The harmonies involved were very, and the rhythms that were involved were very sophisticated. And you had to be good to play it. That's why Charlie Parker was so famous because he handled it like it was nothing. He just went through the chord changes like they, did, like they were nothing, you know? Yeah. Uh, and his tonality, uh, he was a, a great uh, Kansas City, uh, tight blues uh, musician, and he brought all that with him to New York. But when he started playing bebop along with that, a whole new world opened up. <laughs> yeah, so, what do you think you'd be doing right now if you hadn't gone into music and you know made a career for yourself? Is there any other kind of passions you had? Um, I know I saw you roller skating in the uh, Give Me the Night video, maybe professional roller skater or something else that that you really liked uh, coming up. Yeah, I was. I actually loved loved uh, science, and I think that's what happened with my guitar. I became a musical scientist. I began to search for things that the guitar had not done. Mm -hmm. After hearing Montgomery and a few other approaches and hanging out with the greatest guitar players in the world, Barney Kessel, I went on tour with him. Uh, it was like going to a great college because he was passing out lessons every day. So I liked hanging out with him, though he, he made me feel this big, but, <laughs> but I learned something. I was going to college by hanging out with him. Him and, um, and what was his name? Uh, uh, Jim Hall. We were on tour in Europe, and every day Barney Kelsey beat us up like stepchilds. <laughs> but what a nice beating up! At the end of that tour, man, I came home with some wonderful stuff, man, that Barney had showed me. Just being in his presence. Yeah. Going back to some of the clubs you mentioned, um, Wiley Avenue in the Hill District. Was there one that kind of stands out to you? I know a lot of musicians I've talked I have talked to always mentioned the Crawford Grill, obviously. Um, was there one in particular that you remember fondly or running into a lot of guys? And if you have any stories, we'd love to hear them. There were two greats. The one you mentioned a minute ago, um, Crawford's Grill. The owner of it was quite an incredible guy. He was a genius. He was a, he was a, a wig, a great brain. Lots of money too. He knew how to make money. And that club was very sophisticated, very nicely arranged. It was really a great place to be. And there was one called the Hurricane. 
The woman who owned that was Bertie Dunlap. And her and her husband, whose name was Shine. <laughs> that was the R&B house. We had everybody. So between the two clubs, we had everybody. One would be Arthur Prysock down there, you know, at the R&B house, and him and his brother. And uh, or it would be Jimmy Smith, or Johnny Hammond Smith, or people like that. And then up at the, um, the other club, um, what's the jazz club you mentioned? The Crawford Grill. The Crawford Grill had um, Take Five was um, was Take Five the, the the originator who wrote that song. Mm, I'm not sure. Who be do 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 da 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 yeah. The Dave Brubeck Quartet. Dave Brubeck. Now, why <laughs> come I couldn't think of that? Because he was a friend of mine. <laughs> but I, I got so many friends. But he sticks out because he's such a great, he was such a great musician. And he wrote these incredible songs. Blue Ronda Alator was another wizard kind of song, but you had to be a wizard to play it. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, um, and we saw everybody there. Um, Ron Carter's first group was the Jazz Brothers featuring uh, Chuck Man Jones, oh. the Man Jones Brothers. That's why they called them the Jazz Brothers, but it wasn't their group though, it was Ron Carter's group. And they were all coming out of Berkeley School of Music. Not Berkeley's, uh, Rochester. Uh, what they call that? Um, the camera people there. Um, but it was a Rochester uh, music school they graduated from. They had master's degrees when they were 23 years old. <laughs> yeah. And they were indeed um, master musicians. So a lot of that kind of thing was going on. Chico Hamilton Quartet, featuring Gabor Zabo on guitar, you know, and uh, Charles Lloyd uh, playing all these crazy things on either the flute or the tennis night. I saw all of that stuff, man. They were right across the street. I used to play right across the street from the Crawford Grill. Yeah. At a corner tavern, a corner bar, and uh, they used to come over from the from uh, the Crawford Grill to see me at the club when I was about seventeen years old. Yeah, and they said, "Man, you know something? You you could play jazz if you wanted to." I said, "No, I can't play jazz." He said, "Yes, you could." Two years later, I saw um, West Montgomery's brother, uh, the youngest one, not Monk Montgomery. Yeah, maybe it was him. The one who played keyboards. And he saw me at the jazz workshop. He said, I've seen you before. I said, I'm from Pittsburgh. He said, I told you you could play jazz guitar. <laughs> and I saw him at the jazz workshop in San Francisco. And he reminded me that we had that conversation. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So of all the songs and all the albums you've written, if there was one album or song that you would tell somebody, hey, this defines me as a musician, or this is one of my favorite things to play, and this is who I am. Is there a song or album you can kind of uh, name for us that defines you, or would you say it's, again, sort of a free form for you that whatever you're doing at the time, that's what it is? I learned to think like that because things change. Time changes everything. Era changes. What used to be important is not important. And what used to be unimportant is important all of a sudden. So you have to be flexible to do that. But you got to keep your musicianship up because you don't know which way it's going to go. Mm-hmm. Somebody had to come out of nowhere. There's a cat called Pat Martino. You ever heard of me? He's 17 years old. And I'll play almost anybody in the world. Yeah. So you got to be prepared for that kind of stuff. you know. And also um, singers, uh, people Bryson. I heard about him when he was a little boy. Um, Gladys Knight told us about him. She said, you know, we got a little boy in our church. We know he's not going to be ordinary. Mm-hmm. So when I heard this voice on the radio, I said, it's got to be the boy she was talking about. Because I can't think of anybody can out sing this young fellow. And sure enough, she said, yeah, that's the boy I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. I know it seems like you have been evolving your sound um, throughout the decades. Like you said, it's always changing. I uh, even most recently saw your collaboration uh, with the Gorillas on that song, Humility. And uh, 
you could definitely obviously see the influence between some of your big hits uh, for them, including looks like um, Give Me the Night and uh, Breezin for sure, definitely heavily influenced them. How did that come to be? Did they reach out to you and say, we're huge fans, we'd love to do this? Or how did that come to be? First, I thought it was an insult. Oh. The guys called me and said, my, my, my manager or secretary, manager, she's manager and secretary, she said, there's a group called the Gorillas who want to record with you. And I said, ain't no way in the world I'm gonna record with a group called the Gorillas. I thought it was an African-American group called the Gorillas. I said, that's all we need. Somebody calling us Gorillas. <laughs> she said, no, no, it's not African-American. She said, these are uh, uh, Caucasians. They're from uh, Great Britain. I said, no. I said, you gotta be kidding me. Yeah. So she said, just, just take a listen to it and see when I heard it, I said, nah. <laughs> I can't think of nothing to play on this. And I don't want to fool them and I don't want to take their money. Mm -hmm. So when she sent it back to them, they said, can you ask Mr. Ben, just put something on him. We think that what he'll put on it will be significant. We can hear him on this record. I said, send it to me. She sent it back with another song that was terrible. <laughs> I said, let me hear the first song again. Maybe I can do something with that. Oh, this one ain't gonna work. <laughs> so I listened to it and I said, I told my engineer, you know what, man? This is a, a nice band. Turn it up. Put the speakers on, man. Then we got all this equipment here. Turn it up. And he's a guy who's very sensitive. You know, he's a jazz musician. He likes everything, you know. Just so. I said, man, forget that. Turn it up. <laughs> so he turned it up and I could feel the band for the first time. I said, there I am. I'm sitting right over there in that chair <laughs> with the band. I'm the guitar player in this band. Turn this up, man. Let me put record. He put it in record mode and it was all natural as, as rain. So that's how we ended up doing that. And when they heard it, they said, yeah, this is better than what we thought we, you know, <laughs> we were going to get. <laughs> Yeah, that was great. I mean, you could definitely see the influence and, uh, you know, the talent you brought. I love that, that project, time. man. I'm yeah. glad that they, they stuck in there and, you know, and, uh, and and hung in there with me and got me to do what was the right thing to do. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, so I got two more questions for you. Um, one of them being, what's a bigger accomplishment for you, winning multiple Grammys or being recognized as a jazz master by the National Endowment of the Arts? Both of them are tremendous. One is an industry related thing. And it's good to know that the people who are exposed to your music are accepting it. That's what the Grammys do. And they give you tremendous exposure you can't get any other way. And uh, the endowment of the arts says I'm an artist. And it matches up to the incident that happened to me when I was a teenager. No, I was coming out of my teens, I was with Jack McDuff. And we, we were being interviewed. Uh, they were reviewing one of our records or, or show that we had done. And they called me a guitarist. And nobody had ever called me a guitarist before. Yeah. They called me a guitar player or a guitar lover, but they never called me a guitarist. Mm -hmm. That stuck in my mind like it was an elevation in my life. It was like a stepping stone. Yeah. And I had a great, great, time um, practicing after that. Practicing meant something to me then, because it meant I was making movements, I was going somewhere. So that was a big step in my life. Okay, George, just one last question for you then. Is there a um, piece of advice maybe that someone's given you before that you just kind of carried on through your career that's helped you maybe to get to where you are today? Wonderful thing is that we learn from each other, man. I don't care where you are in the world. The daughter of, of Ravi Shankar <laughs> became a superstar. You know, that's Nora Jones, right? Mm -hmm. Her dad was the number one sitar player in the world. And his little baby, one of his babies, grew up to be a fantastic singer and they had one of the biggest records in record history. It shows what we can learn from each other. She come all over India with that. 
you know, that's her, her heritage is from there. Her bloodline is that. Mm -hmm. Her father was a world traveler. Very highly respected. But that's what the world is. I don't care where you go in the world. When I went to Russia, I was in the lobby of a hotel and I heard this incredible song. The piano player was on a different level, second level. But I walked up to the piano and I said, what is that incredible song you're playing? She was in the middle of playing. She said, you're kidding me, George Benson. I was shocked that she knew who I was, first of all. She said, you're kidding me, George Benson. I said, that's not one of my songs. She said, yes, it's one of your songs. I couldn't believe it, man. But she was playing crap out Because you know how technically great musicians in Russia, they insist on technical genius. That's what she was. So I found that I can learn something from anybody. I don't care where you're from. You know, I did a record with um, uh, Tomatito. Can you imagine me playing flamenco guitar? I don't know nothing about no flamenco, man. I know I like it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there's some great, great players. And so, but I was a listener. And one day he asked me to record with him. I said, what can we play together? We can't play nothing together, man. Because it's so different, the, the basis of the songs. And it turned out to be one of my favorite things I like hearing back that I've ever played. I hear it and I said, that can't be me playing guitar, man. With Tomatito, no. <laughs> That's great. All right, George. Well, thank you for your time. I'll let you go. And um, we appreciate you making time to sit down with us and uh, talk about Black History Month and being a Pittsburgh jazz legend. Thank you so much. It's an honor. Thank you.